We should go ahead and get started. I want to introduce our speaker. So today we have our first Joan seminar of the term. Um, and we have John Comissus joining us from Columbia University. John is the Kenneth Breyer Professor of Electrical Engineering at Columbia, and he's also Vice Dean for Infrastructure and Innovation at the Food Foundation School of Engineering. John graduated with his bachelor's, his master's, and his PhD from MIT. So he's been up in our neck of the woods before. And his master's thesis was also performed as a co-op at the IBM DJ Watson Research Lab, and where he studied organic thermal transistors. And then he did his PhD in the Microsystems Technology Lab at MIT, working on field emission displays. Uh, after graduation, he spent a few years as a postdoc in MIT's lab for organic optics and electronics, uh, working on a variety of organic electronic devices, and was also a senior engineer for QD Vision, which was later acquired by Samsung. Um, he joined Columbia in electrical engineering as an assistant professor in 2006, and served as the chair of the department from 2020 to 2024. Uh, John is also a fellow of the IEEE, OPSCA, and the Society for Information Display, and is currently the president of the SID. Uh, so we're looking forward to John's talk here today. He's going to be discussing electronics on anything. So a nice uh, broad coverage of some really interesting topics in thin-film electronics and other optoelectronic devices. So um, let's welcome John and uh, get our Joan Seminar is off to a good start here this term. Cool. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. I should give shorter summaries of my life because I, it's like I started MIT as a freshman, I left as a postdoc, and I went to Columbia. And that's basically it. Which is fine. Um, but great, thank you so much. Um, and thanks for the really kind invitation and the hospitality. It's really amazing to see all the work that's happening here uh, at Dartmouth. And I think uh, you, uh, as students, you're all extremely lucky uh, to be here and in the mix. Um, so I'm gonna speak uh, a little bit today about electronics and anything, which I realize is an extremely vague title, which uh, it's good, you know, people ask for the title. You wanna give something general so that you can sort of sort in, but there is a theme to it, which we'll get to. Um, but before we get started, I just want to say hello from Columbia. Um, you know, Columbia, like Dartmouth, was founded a long time ago by American standards and is a baby by global standards. Uh, I was at the University of Bologna, and they laugh when you say it's an old university. Well, of course, you know, they're a thousand years old or so. We're not, and that's okay. But, um, you know, Columbia was founded as King's College uh, under King George II, and his grandson, King George III, uh, was a little less popular. And so uh, after the revolution, they needed to change the name. And so it was named Columbia College. And my understanding of the situation is that there was an expectation that the new country might be called Columbia. And uh, that's at least the story that I've been told. And that didn't work out, but the university is still called that. <laughs> so it is what it is. And um, I'm in the engineering school, which started as a school of mines. Um, and uh, is, is annoying to stay. Now, my department is uh, electrical engineering, and we have 29 faculty, um, and we're not that big, but we have about 100 undergraduates. Uh, we also have another 100 that are in computer engineering, which for complicated reasons is under our department, but is not, um, but also shared with computer science. Uh, and then we have uh, a graduate program as well. And please do come visit. It's not that far. I, you can drive very easily. And we do have some grass, not a lot. Um, and there are actually exactly four lawns. They actually, they, they made two new lawns by putting flags up. There used to be two lawns, but they got kind of too beaten up. So they then made two other lawns like sort of reservable. And so if there's a red flag, you're not allowed, you can still sunbathe, but you can't play Frisbee or soccer. Um, and that helps rotate the wear on the lawns uh, in, normal, in normal times, let's say which is great. Now, for graduate students and postdocs, we are going to have faculty search this year, and we will have two openings. Um, one of those is going to be in quantum, and uh, we can talk more if you're interested, but it will definitely be for somebody on the more, uh, I'll say, algorithmic and processing side of quantum, and less on the hardware and uh, you know, freezer dilution fridges. We just hired two people in that area. Um, and there's also gonna be an open search, which is not really open, but it'll be in uh, circuits or signal processing. And if we find two amazing people, we might be able to squeeze a third position. So that would be great. And if there are any undergrads that you work with, uh, I am going to be 
uh, running a uh, RU site at Columbia also, which is a great chance for students to learn if they like Columbia and it's joint with City University. Uh, and it's called Nano NYC and uh, it should be a lot of fun. And uh, of course, we have our PhD program there. Okay. So what does my group do? So my group builds, measures, and uses thin film devices. And uh, these are some pictures from my lab, and I'm not gonna talk about everything, but what are thin film devices? Uh, you know, a lot of times I, I mention this and people have no idea what I'm talking about. And um, you know, thin film devices, they're, they're a way of making electronics. So you know, when you take your normal transistor class, um, you know, the class always starts with, with mining silicon, and you know, in the fires of Mordor, you draw this amazing boule of silicon and you, you, it's all kinds of distillation and purification and Tchaikovsky growth and all this stuff. And then you basically make this huge tube, and I say we, I mean, there's only a couple companies that can do it now because these are enormous. Um, and this is cut into plates, those plates are wafers, and then you make the electronics starting with a almost perfect single crystal of silicon. Single crystal silicon has very high performance thanks to its crystal nature. And, um, you know, and, and the value multiplication is enormous. I mean, a, a blank wafer might be a few hundred dollars in the 12 inch size and a completed wafer, you know, is worth in the hundreds of thousands or even more dollars. And if this was not the CEO at that time, he would have been fired for holding it with his bare hands. He was fired for other reasons later for poor financial performance. But, you know, when you're the head of Intel, you, you it has to make money also, and that's a different story. Um, but the, the value multiplication there is, is enormous, and, and a big part of that is the high quality of the silicon. Now, I mentioned that that's normal electronics, and actually most, something like 80% um, of the value that you see in semiconductor devices is from those types of devices. So these are chips, imagers, power electronics, RF systems, things like that. There is, however, a very large industry in what's known as thin film electronics. And by far, by far, the biggest market for thin film electronics is displays. Now, when you make displays, you know, we're, we're all looking at our phones or at a TV. You know, a TV, for example, might have a huge piece of glass, you know, 75 inches on the diagonal. Um, you know, that glass is too big for us to put a single crystal silicon piece of wafer or part of a wafer. But the good thing is we don't need that. What we can do is we can start with the glass and we can deposit certain semiconductors on that piece of glass. And that process is called the thin film process. And thin film electronics is this idea of instead of starting with the electrically active material, we start with a substrate that does something, and then we add semiconductors to it. And that's all we do. And so we, I'll give a couple of examples of how we do this. Um, and there are advantages and disadvantages. I mean, we don't do it for everything. Um, because you know, the performance is often not as good. And when you make a silicon transistor, you need to implant and anneal, and that annealing and growth of oxides and other things you know, can happen at very high temperatures. Glass does not tolerate extremely high temperatures. Um, and so some functions may not be available, some performance may not be accessible. But uh, the nice thing about it, at least from an academic research perspective, is that we can start with substrates that are interesting. I mean, glass is, is nice, and I, we use glass sometimes, but we can also start with other active materials and then sprinkle electronics on top. And that's really the theme, if anything, of my research, which is why I wanted to title the talk Electronics on Anything. So we start with the anything, usually something that's active, and then we add electronics to it in order to improve the functionality. Anyway, so I like to think of it a little bit as a toolbox where, you know, we can go and, and, and in addition to starting with the substrate and adding electronics, we can also add more electronics. So I can add a photodetector and a display, or I can add a photovoltaic cell and some transistors or whatever, and I'll show a few examples of them. Now, one of the building blocks for this is the thin film transistor, and I'll speak in a little more detail about organic field effect transistors, and we use a few different types. But organic field effect transistors, I think, are, they've been, I've worked on them for a long time. I mentioned that my master's thesis was on organic FETs. I thought I would go out in the world and be the champion person who had worked on it longer than anyone else. And commercially, organic field effect transistors have been a disappointment. Maybe disaster would be <laughs> an even more polite term. But 
for research purposes, organic fuel effect transistors are amazing because the first thing about them is that they can be processed at extremely low temperatures. And, and, and that's because organic fuel effect transistors, the, the, the bonds between the molecules are not covalent bonds. The, the molecules themselves have covalent bonds internally, but the molecules with each other are bonded using van der Waals bonds. And van der Waals bonds are quite weak. So making the material starting from a bottle of the source material and going to a finished transistor does not require the input of a lot of energy, often no energy at all. You just dissolve the material and print it, or sometimes you can evaporate it at very low temperatures. Now, we can do a lot of the same processing that we do for other transistors, which is nice. So we can make pretty sophisticated systems, but we can put them on thermally sensitive substrates. Then, you know, an example of one of those substrates that we've done a lot of work on is a piezoelectric polymer called PVDF. My group's been working a fair bit on making touch sensors using this piezoelectric polymer. I mean, PVDF has been known for quite some time. It was first discovered to be piezoelectric in the late 60s. And uh, there, there are some commercial applications for it. Um, and what's, what, what's nice about it as a piezoelectric material is that um, first, it's extremely inexpensive. And, um, and the polymer itself has this structure that you see here. So there are carbons, and every other carbon has either two fluorines or it has two hydrogens. Now, it's possible to crystallize the PVDF so that preferentially some of the fluorines point one way and some of the hydrogens point the other way. That gives you a dipole moment since the fluorine abstracts more of the electron density than the hydrogen does. And once the material is crystallized and pulled, it can then give some piezoelectric character. And it's not the best piezoelectric in the world, but it has a couple of things going for it. One is, even though the, the transmission of strain to charge, or what's sometimes called the D33, is not that great, the transmission of force to charge is extremely good because the material is really soft. So with a little bit of force, you get a lot of strain, and so it is absolutely a champion in the translation of force to uh, signal that we can then detect. A second thing about it, which is unusual, is that it can also withstand a couple percent strain. You know, most piezoelectrics are ceramics, and when you take a ceramic and you start to pull on it, usually 1%, maybe 0.8%, you're, you're done. It cracks and nothing else will happen. And PVDF can handle 3% strain, maybe even more. So you can use it in many more applications than you might consider a ceramic. It's got a great acoustic impedance match to water, so you can make hydrophones and other things out of it. It's got a lot going for it. So, I mean, if it's so amazing, I don't use it for everything. And the biggest and most serious problem is, I mentioned before that we can crystallize it to get that phase where the fluorines preferentially point one way and the hydrogen is the other. It turns out that that phase is not the thermodynamically stable phase of the material. So you can kind of trick it into going into that phase using a number of processing techniques, but when you heat it to 80, maybe 90 degrees Celsius, it undergoes a solid phase recrystallization into the most stable phase, which unfortunately is paraelectric. And so you lose the piezoelectric character. I mean, well below the melting point. This is not the material melting. It's really a recrystallization. So we're a little bit limited in what we can do thermally. The second issue is, as I mentioned before, that it only produces a small amount of charge when it's stimulated. And if you're making just a single sensor, that's not a big deal, but you'll see that we want to make some bigger arrays, and that means that we have to find a way to detect that small amount of charge at a distance. So the solution that we've been working on for some time is to put active electronics directly onto the PVDF. Now, the first thing I mentioned before is that the thermal budget that we have is quite limited, so we need to use transistors, which we can process at low temperatures. Organic field effect transistors, they, they meet that requirement. So that low thermal budget respects the Curie point. The second part is, uh, we can talk about this more in the Q&A if people have questions, but we can make two different kinds of transistors. The transistor on the left is kind of a boring, normal, thin film transistor. And it might look upside down, because it is, but there's a gate, there's a gate dielectric, the source and drain, the semiconductor, and there you change the gate, the channel changes, and you can do your normal transistor amplification or switching. The transistor here on the right, though, is different, because this one, you'll notice, doesn't have a gate. And this transistor instead is gated by the charge that we have on the PVDF. 
And so this forms for us an extremely tightly coupled and very high bandwidth charge amplifier that allows us to go from the small amount of charge to a current. And detecting that current at a distance is much easier than detecting the charge that we have from the PVDF. So there are lots of things we can do to play with it. And again, just sort of throwing several students' theses into one slide, you can play with the threshold voltage, make a raise, printing, whatever, you know, self-aligned processes. But this is maybe one of the champion devices that we have. And so this is an active matrix microphone. It's five by five centimeters, about this big. And um, it has, uh, it's fully matrixed. So it's got eight rows, eight columns, and one common in the back. And what's most important here is that it has two different types of transistors. It has one set of transistors that do the amplification and a second set that does the switching. And so even though there's an enormous amount of parasitic capacitance, that's okay because we amplify before we hit those parasitics. And you can overcome a parasitic capacitance with a current, which you can't do if you leave the signal as a chart. All right, there's lots of things you can do with it. You can, you can use it to map turbulence. You can, you can you know, play a lot of games. You can, one of the sort of silly things to do is, you know, the microphone is big enough that you can see the wavelength of sound and you can do this other ways too. But, you know, this is, uh, my student put this in an anechoic chamber, and created a, like a interference pattern of the sound and you can map it out. And there's lots of, lots of kind of big things you can do which are fun. But what's also nice is that it also scales to a small size. And uh, one of the application areas that we've been working on this most actively, which is a collaboration with uh, uh, both Columbia Medical Center and Mass Ear, has been making a miniature version of this that we can then put inside the ear. Uh, because it turns out that the best place to put an implantable microphone is at the ear. Who knew, you know, there's been a lot of work on trying to make uh, microphones for uh, cochlear implant patients when you remove the headset. About half the day, the headset, for children at least, is not attached, and uh, there's, some evidence, in addition to sort of the practical issues, there's some evidence that that delays the uh, development of the, the understanding of speech. Um, and uh, so, so putting just a microphone under the skin, you wind up picking up like the rubbing of the clothes and it's just not that good. And who knew, millions of years of evolution, you have the impedance match of the ears, and everything is just there. And so we've been able to use the same system both inside the cochlea, which is nice, and more recently we have a version in which it flexes where it's glued to the umbo, and that, uh, that works really well. We've also licensed this for some surgical instruments uh, as well with a company called Synaptive Medical that um, basically uses it there. So anyway, so there are lots of things you can do with it, right? So we can take kind of the same idea and then sort of mix it with uh, other devices and then, you know, I always tell people you have a hammer. As an engineer, you need to look for nails, and so I think all of these are great nails, and that's one, one kind of direction to go. Now, a second area that we've been working a lot is in micro LEDs. And um, if you're not familiar with micro LEDs, don't worry. Um, LEDs are amazing. I mean, LEDs are the brightest controlled structured light source that man has developed so far. Um, I mean, we've made lasers, and lasers are great. But lasers, you get one beam of light, or maybe a couple of beams of light, or whatever. Um, but with LEDs, what's, what's terrific is that you can get this extremely high luminance, high color quality and high efficiency all in the same system. And we've been looking at how to make new types of displays this way um, in order to you know, particularly focus on augmented reality, although more recently we've been looking at non-display applications as well. Now, if you've ever been on the subway or I don't know, you guys have a bus which has like one of those image boards, motion boards with the, the LEDs that tells you when the next bus is coming. So one thing that I always recommend to people, no? All right, people seem to not be. That's okay. I'm gonna, all right, I'm gonna. The is not as good here. Uh, okay. Where would you, where might you have seen one of those? Uh, I don't know, I'm trying to think. <laughs> I'll show a picture later. Anytime you're curious about how a display works, like I always recommend to my students, take out your phone, put it in slow-mo video mode, and take a video of the display. And um, you know, if you've ever seen like those LED light, or, like if you've ever been Times Square, or seen like those big LED displays, like those are driven using what's called a passive matrix. 
And so what happens is uh, if you want to show like a character display, okay. another example in New York City is the, the boards that are on all the falafel carts that say like in broken English, like, you know, have delicious falafel. You've seen those, right? Okay, people sort of know what I'm talking about. So, all right, you look at those and, you know, it has letters and it has like uh, whatever things that are happening. But if you, if you look at it in slow-mo, you see something interesting, which is that it doesn't write the whole pattern at once. Instead, the way that it works is it flashes the first line, it flashes the second line, it flashes the third line, and then it goes through the whole display, and then it cycles again. And when you look at it in the slow-mo video, you can see this sort of rolling effect. But when you look at it with your eyes, it looks, it looks fine. And, and the reason that it has that effect is that the, the LEDs are matrixed. And basically, you reverse bias all the rows except the first row, and you flash the first row, and then you go to the second row and the third row and the fourth row. All good. Now, if you have 10 rows, there's one issue, which is that you have to flash the first row 10 times brighter than you're running the display the rest of the time. And you know, for 10 rows, that might be fine. But what happens if you have 100 rows or 1,000 rows? Well, if you have 1,000 rows, you only get one one thousandth of the time to do that flashing. And so if we look at the resisted drop in the interconnect, not getting too deeply into the math, it turns out that that voltage drop that you get across the row is proportional to the number of rows cubed. So you don't see those displays run in a passive matrix format if they have a thousand rows or two thousand rows. And even a relatively low end display today, you know, if you go to Costco, you see 4K displays, I mean, that's 4,000 rows almost in the display. It's like 3,800. It's, it's various, there's various reasons that it's not exactly 4,000, but anyway, it is what it is. So n cubed really quickly runs away. It turns out that if we run it with an active matrix, what is an active matrix? A passive matrix is where you just take advantage of that, uh, the asymmetry in the IV characteristic of the LED, and we can reverse bias the other LEDs. Um, in an active matrix, what we do is we throw a transistor on. And instead of flashing, we program the first one, we let it sit, we program the second one, we let it sit, and we keep going. That voltage drop is only proportional to N squared. And N squared sounds bad, but trust me, it's much better than N cubed, that factor of N, because you don't have that overdrive. You don't have to flash it that high. And so it's entirely practical. But the challenge is that you need transistors to do this. And so my group, we've been working a lot on figuring out how to do this for LEDs. And this is kind of a, a cartoon of how we've been doing it. So basically, we start with the LED, which is made using ion nitride. And then we can throw transistors directly on top. And I, I say that as if it's easy, but it's not. But there are a couple of tricks. One of the most important tricks for us is we need, we need pretty good transistors. I mentioned before that we can use organic field effect transistors for certain things. And you know, the microphone has like no current. LEDs, when they're driven at their full intensity, are driven at 1,000 amps per centimeter square, which is not happening with organic LEDs. So we need much better transistors. And fortunately, those are available. Um, and I'm for, at Columbia, James M is a collaborator of mine. And he has a really terrific setup, which allows us to put down a layer of amorphous silicon and then recrystallize it and get polycrystalline silicon, which can handle much higher currents. And now, you'll ask, wait a second, if I'm converting amorphous silicon to crystalline silicon, doesn't that take heat? And the answer is it does. But there's an important trick, which is we start with the substrate. We can put down a layer of something that's thermal, a thermal barrier like silicon dioxide. And then we can put down a thin layer of amorphous silicon. And SiO2 has a very high melting point, um, you know, over 2,000 Celsius. Whereas silicon, I mean, the melting point's high, but it's not that high. It's like 1,500 or so Celsius. And so what we can do is we can hit it with a laser that has a very short pulse. So it gets hot. It cools. The cooling is the silicon melting, kind of like ice cubes melting in a glass. And it sucks in the heat of fusion. It pushes that back out when it, when it solidifies sort of like getting a steam burn where it like pushes that back out at you. And then it relaxes. All of that happens in maybe 0.2 microseconds. And so we can melt the silicon on top, but the bottom where the substrate is doesn't see any of that heat because it takes maybe two microseconds for the heat to diffuse from the top to the bottom. And by the time that happens, it's spread out over a much larger thermal mass. 
So the bottom only sees maybe a temperature of 100 C. And this is used all the time. We didn't invent this. Uh, if you have an Apple Watch uh, after the fourth generation, or if you have certain, uh, Apple Watch is probably the most best known thing, but that's made basically the same way, but on a piece of plastic. The, the newer iPhone displays are made this way as well. And that's done right on plastic using essentially the same technique. So we've done this, and we've been able to demonstrate on, on, on various types of LEDs, and then you know you can throw it into uh, more. Whoa! I don't know what happened there. <gasps> oh my God! Sorry, uh, PowerPoint crashed. I don't know why. We'll get there. Nice slow zoom. Oh boy, sorry, I know why. There's a video that I'm gonna have to skip. Oh, that's painful. All right. Sorry about that. Oh, no worries. All right, let's try not having that video. All right, so it's ah, the pain. All right, I'm gonna try just sharing the screen instead of the application. Let's see if this may work a little better. So it's possible to use that to make displays. And sorry, the previous slide, which is causing it to crash, is a video of the display. But it's a display that's at 1 million nits. And just to give you an idea, this projector is projecting an image that's around 300 nits. Your phone might be in, you know, when it's at its maximum brightness, might be 1,000 nits. And you know, LEDs are really bright. And if we can drive them at that high current density, we can make very high intensity displays, which is nice. Now, OK. That's fine for displays, and you know there's been, except for uh, the recent uh, Mark Zuckerberg video of him wearing a micro LED display for one second. Um, no one has used micro LED micro displays to do anything that exciting. Um, so we've been looking at other things to do in addition to displays, and um, you know one of the more interesting applications I think is using them for non-display applications, so particularly for things like super resolution microscopy. Um, so we have a collaboration with a group at the University of Colorado in which uh, they build what are known as miniscopes, and these are microscopes that get implanted into the brains of animals. And, um, and, and one of the challenges there is that the traditional approach is to have a single LED and you shine light, or maybe two LEDs, and you then have uh, illumination for the brain, and that makes a perfectly fine microscope. But there's a lot of interest in using sort of super resolution and control techniques in order to get better light. Because the optics are, as you can imagine, pretty limited um, since the whole thing has to fit into a tube that's about um, two millimeters in diameter. And so there's a lot of aberration and other, other challenges. So what we've been working on is a series of illuminators. Uh, and one of those that we recently had a paper on is just a series of bars. And we basically flash the bars in three phases and then reconstruct the photos that we get. And that allows us to get a significantly higher resolution than we would otherwise. Um, and then we've also made a 2D version, which is basically a projector. It's not that different from a display, but with the use, with the interest um, of making something for um, doing optogenetic stimulation. So that's pretty much that part of it. Now, I mentioned um, this idea of doing projection for um, using LEDs, but it's also possible to use art thin film techniques to also do sensing over large areas. Instead of starting with something small 
and projecting over a big area using optics. It's also possible to use thin film techniques to start with something big and continue with something big. And one of the areas that I've been excited about is mapping blood flow. Uh, mapping blood flow is particularly critical for um, understanding healing and, and, and a number of biological processes. But one of the areas that we first started working on is mapping epilepsy. Um, so when, when an epileptic patient presents, uh, most epileptics are cured using drugs. I mean, 80% or so of epilepsy cases can be managed using pharmacological interventions, but about 20% require surgery. And the first step to successful surgery is figuring out what the focus is of the epileptic seizure. So understanding where the, the seizure starts and then removing the part that leads to that positive feedback loop. Now, the group that we're working with has shown that the brain, it's very tightly vasoregulated. You know, you look at the brain, the brain uses, what, 20% or so of the body's energy, but when you look at it, you don't see any blood, right? It looks white because of all the, the scattering, but the brain only delivers blood exactly where it's needed. Otherwise, it would suck up all of the oxygen of the body. And, and this is why functional MRI works. So by looking at how the blood flow changes in the brain, you can also map out where there's activity in the brain. And uh, our collaborators have been using suspended cameras to do this and, and have shown that the resolution of that technique is better than 100 microns. Now, the state of the art today for mapping the, the brain before doing surgery is to put a series of electrodes in to do what's called electrocorticography. Now, unfortunately, because those electrodes are floating in a saline bath, it only gives a resolution of about a centimeter, maybe a little better than that. And so, you know, something that sits between those two extremes would be, would be welcome. And so we've been working um, for some time with this group on uh, figuring out how to make an implantable system that does that optical measurement and uh, finding a way to fit it under the skull. And so when I first started at Columbia, I was really into organic semiconductors, which is great. And so um, I proposed making an organic light emitting diode, organic photodetector stack, which then would do exactly this kind of reflectometry, super flexible, could fit on the brain, um, and you can make very good photodetectors. So that part was relatively straightforward. Um, and, and, and it was great. We can make it on, on various plastic sheets and it, it worked just fine. But there was definitely a serious issue, which is at least in my group, organic light emitting diodes are, are pretty sensitive to water and oxygen. And uh, so we would deliver these to the, to the surgeons. You know, they would be all sealed from our glove box. They'd rip them open and then they would drown them in saline. And unfortunately, while we were getting results where it would last maybe a day or so in the air. For them, it would last maybe an hour when it was swimming underwater. So, okay, we got our papers, we we're ready to move on. What's the solution? So the solution was really to move to LEDs. And um, you know, with LEDs, one of the, the nice things is that there's now uh, commercially available a wide range of small LED chiplets. You can do exactly what we did with the organic light emitting diodes put the LED chiplets down and use those to make the same kind of reflectometry measurements. And just like with the organic LEDs, it turns out that the chiplets also make very good photo detectors. I initially panicked because we could get, you know, we had a nice collaboration with the company Cree and they, they could send us all kinds of LEDs. And I was like, oh, could you guys format the photo, some photo detector the same way? And they're like, nope, we don't do photo detectors. And that was it. That was like, ah. And then what we wound up doing is, of course, use a you know, blue LED, green LED. The green LED is a great photo detector for blue light. It actually has a really good, really good detectivity. Um, and, and we're able to then get a system which lasts forever underwater, which is quite nice. And so that, that works, and you can do color conversion, lots of other tricks, add quantum dots to then do um, other, other, kind of, uh, other kinds of analyses uh, as well. All right, so we have the system, we have the hammer, we're looking for our nails. So one of my collaborators, uh, another one of my collaborators, has been working on diffuse scattering. Has anyone ever taken like a flashlight and shown it through their finger? Like, and, and you can kind of sort of see the bones, but not really. So it turns out that you, can, you can't really see the bones with a single shot like that. But if you take multiple shots, you can actually map out exactly where your bones are. And there's mathematical technique um, called inverse scattering in which you basically create a model and you can uniquely show with 
multiple images axially through your finger, for example, where your bones are and where the space is. And you can also use it on fleshy parts of the body. And if you have light coming in and light being detected at different distances, you can use the same inverse scattering technique to figure out what's happening deeper inside the body. And so we took exactly the same thing that we built for the brain. This is the organic light emitting diode version of it, wrapped it around someone's finger. And uh, we actually were able to do a clinical trial of patients with lupus. And in lupus and arthritis, there's some change in both the hemodynamics of the finger as well as the cushioning between the bones of the finger. And we're able to then measure the space that's in between, which is kind of nice. And we did another study, same exact system, but we did it on someone's, on, on the patient's toe. Um, so another very serious uh, health threat um, is what's called diabetic foot syndrome. So people that have diabetes have reduced circulation to their feet. And uh, it turns out that patients, the first time you have an amputation below the knee, you have a prognosis of five years. Like it's that bad because people stop moving and then it creates uh, a, a lot of challenges. So there's a lot of work and we, so this collaborated with a university and a medical school in Jordan where the, they have a, an institute on diabetic foot syndrome. Um, there's a surgery which can reconnect the veins in your leg, but it's only successful about half the time. And so uh, it's very difficult to tell if the surgery worked and if it has to be revised. And so by using this measurement around the toe, we were able to then figure out for the blood vessel that was being connected, whether or not the circulation had returned. And uh, that um, hopefully is uh, continuing. You can also do this in the breasts. And um, this is not going to detect breast cancer, but what it can do is look at the healing after, breast, after surgery. So when there's a resection, um, you know, the blood vessels then regrow. And uh, in normal healing, the blood vessels regrow relatively uniformly. Uh, but if there's still some residual cancer, uh, that site then recruits additional blood vessels. And my collaborator, Andreas Holscher, who was at Columbia but moved to NYU uh, a few years ago, has this monstrosity, which uh, is able to measure using uh, optical, it has a it's pretty cool, actually. It's an optical multiplexer and all kinds of photomultiplier tubes. Um, one of my postdocs now works at FIT, and there they have a, a women's garment lab. And so we have a version that you just wear as a garment. It's not quite as good. It doesn't have photomultipliers, but it's able to take um, similar measurements um, using that same kind of diffuse scattering technique. So you know, using the same tools, we can, we can get a lot of, uh, a lot of data and really apply it to a lot of other, other applications. All right, I don't wanna to run too late. I'm gonna speak briefly about two more things and then I'll stop talking to see if there are questions. Um, I mentioned piezoelectrics before and I'm also very interested in thin film piezoelectrics. And uh, you know, one of the challenges with electronics is that they're, they're good at sensing light, they're good at sensing electric fields, but they're not good chemical sensors. And uh, one of the strategies for making chemical sensors is to look at condensation. So you know when you're in the shower and uh, the, 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 you take a hot shower and the mirror is cold and the vapors of the shower then condense on the mirror. And it turns out that that happens all the time in the environment. So all the surfaces and everybody that works in high vacuum knows this because you're constantly fighting this. Uh, but there are all kinds of things in the environment. When you smell those delicious cookies, that's a vapor. And that vapor will condense on things and it condenses in your nose, which is why you can smell the cookies. And we can do the same thing and measure how much vapor condenses on, on substrates. Now the mass, of course, of these vapors is very small. I mean, in the shower, of course, it's, it's a very large difference in what's in the air and what's on the surface. But, but it turns out in the air, you can detect it, but you have to have a very sensitive scale at, to measure the mass. And one of the things that I think is sort of uh, interesting is that we can measure how much mass there is by making a resonator. And uh, this is, again, well-established technique. If you've ever used quartz crystal monitor, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, but the sensitivity of that kind of resonator to mass is proportional to the resonant frequency squared. A quartz crystal monitor might be 20 megahertz. So the way to get higher sensitivity is to really push it up. And so we decided to get into this business and to make resonators that are maybe two gigahertz. Like, can we go a factor of a thousand or more above insensitivity? 
So the way we do this is we build directly on the back end of Silicon CMOS. So we order up a chip. Um, we build the resonators using thin film techniques. And, um, and then we can put that all together. And it turns out that by itself, the resonator really doesn't do anything. But what we can do is functionalize the resonator with receptors. Those receptors will have some affinity for the vapors in the environment, and then we can detect what's happening. And basically, we can print like a checkerboard and use that for normalization and detect things that are happening. And basically, at this point, we're on a hunt for different receptors. So we have a collaboration, for example, with an outfit in Austria that makes a receptor for cyclohexanone. And we're able to then detect, cyclohexanone is used to make plastic explosives. And so we're able to detect the cyclohexanone. It's not totally selective, but it's, it's selective enough for their standard test um, against the, the normal confounders, like people's perfume, ethanol, and other things that you might find in the environment. We made lots of versions of this and, 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 and things like that. All right, I'm gonna show one more thing and then I'm gonna stop for questions. And that is actual, I've showed you a lot of sensors. But I think one of the more fun things, I've never really gotten that much into the actuation side of robotics, but I'd like to. And so maybe if you have more inspiration, uh, we can talk more. But uh, I'm gonna attempt to show a video. No, okay, let me not show a video. <laughs> I'm gonna talk through this video that you're not seeing. Uh, this is a material which is a polymer electrostrictor, and basically you apply a voltage and the whole thing curls up. And it happens instantaneously, no liquids, no ions, and it's just kind of cool. And it can give you a really, really high strain. I mean, the strain is about 5%, but there's a dark side to it, which is that you also have to drive it at 500 volts. I know, so it's like, so I showed this to program manager, and he's like, yeah, I don't know, it's, it's Seems wrong somehow. So, all right. I think by now you know my solution to the problem, which is we're gonna add some transistors to this. And, um, and what's amazing about this electric restrictor is that it has a very high dielectric constant. So it's a very soft polymer material. It's actually closely related to PVDF, but it has a dielectric constant of almost 50. And so because of that, when you apply a voltage across two electrodes, the two electrodes, they like each other, so they try to come together, and that's what gives you the strain. So it has a low durometer, and it has that really high epsilon. So I had initially panicked. I uh, mentioned earlier that my PhD was in field emission displays, and what I did for that was I made a 2,000 volt transistor backplane for a field emission display, and I felt really bad because I was gonna ask my students to make a 500 volt backplane. And after we thought about it a little, he's like, wait a second, we don't need to make a gate dielectric. We already have one. There, done. So the substrate itself, has enough dielectric constant to just be the gate dielectric and you're done. So you put the transistors on top, you put the drive on the bottom, he made two copies of it and that's it. And so yes, yes, you have to provide the 400, 500 volts at least once, but you can control it with 30 volts, which is much more achievable and much more normal. What to do with it, I don't think we figured out yet, but we'll let me know. All right, so I hope I've convinced you, you know, crystal electronics are great. I'm not here to tell you that we're gonna overthrow silicon as the most important semiconductor, because we're not. But with thin film electronics, we can start with things that have some functionality and add additional functionality. We can add switching, we can add control, we can add amplification. And uh, the, the thin film approach relaxes the thermal budget and the need for epitaxial templating and related uh, sort of limitations, um, which, which gives us that flexibility and that change that we need. So, you know, I hope that you agree that with this hybrid integration approach, we can mix and match functionalities and put together the systems of the future. So I have to thank the folks that really do the work. Um, about half the people in this photo have graduated, but we have not taken a new one. We had a big wave of graduations. I have to thank, of course, the folks that pay the bills. And thank you very much for your attention. Happy to take questions.